All right, well, should we put the, let's get the slide up. I'll get the screen sharing piece working and make sure I share the right screen because there are many. Uh, I know you recommended we have two monitors, right, so but I'm not a two monitor kind so, of guy, um, <laughs> really. So there's many monitors for me, uh, but that's not a bad thing either. Uh, and thanks so much for letting me participate in this. Uh, it's a great conversation. It's something I think is really important because it's easy to look at the extraordinary set of technology we have in front of us today and just say and, and not be clear that there were definitely we are building on the shoulders of giants, many, many giants. And I want to start the story with one of the giants of computing of all time ever, uh, Alan Turing. So uh, Alan Turing is not the only person behind modern computing, but he's one of the principal people. And he did not coin the term artificial intelligence, but he did ask the question in 1950 in a paper. He, he said quite simply, can machines think? And he described this concept of what he called the imitation game. We would later name it the Turing test, but he would certainly have never named it that way. And so you think about in 1950, the, the, the World War II is not long past, they're still doing recovery, and the modern computer is not really born yet. We have computers, but they are pretty bespoke. They're all one of a kinds. Programming them is quite complex. We're only just beginning to get to the idea of programming languages. And already the question of can machines think is starting to surface. And that paper is referred to as sort of a seminal work that leads in the 50s to broader conversations. And so the first time you really hear the phrase artificial intelligence is in the summer of 1956 when a gathering of these computing scientists, mathematicians, and engineers started to think through, can we create an artificial intelligence? Now, uh, this was in Dartmouth. Marvin Minsky and many others uh, together, they've certainly celebrated all of this. Now that's only in academic circles that we really see that concept. And they start with experimentations in again, early machines. And a lot of the funding for this comes from the military. And so they've been sold this idea that we can build this remarkable machine. They're already predicting by 1956 that in the 1980s, artificial intelligence will be solved, that we'll have an intelligence. This has always been this play of trying to get funding to create something profound. And along the way, various technologies emerge. And in that time, a lot of the most important things that were invented had more to do with logistical planning, which the military needed a lot of and continued to use. The intelligence part, that's a little more complex. And in the 1960s, funding is starting to wind down, but computing is evolving. And I think one of the cornerstones of that was an important man by the name of Gordon Moore. And in 65, he wrote uh, a paper as well. And in that paper, he talked about the beginning of the microprocessor, which he'd, he'd been helping to invent. And he said he noticed a pattern of behavior that for a given amount of money, the amount of transistors you could put on a piece of silicon doubled roughly every 18 months to two years. Now, he didn't call it a law. He called it an observation. He certainly didn't call it Moore's law. Other people called it that. But it was this observation of this doubling of computing uh, potential, not necessarily speed, but really for a given cost, the amount of technology that we packed onto a chip expanded. And I bring this up for a very important reason. The evolution of artificial intelligence is bound to its hardware. And so the iterations of hardware ultimately open new doors to the potential of computing. Now, this is still a largely academic exercise and it's taking place mostly in universities with very large, very expensive computers where every minute of compute time costs money. And so you're seeing scientists pursue, pursue grants to do these experiments. Now, by the time you get into the 60s, we're getting some pretty interesting pieces of software. And Joseph Weizenbaum in 1964 built an app he called Eliza. You could call this the first chat bot, and it was invented even before I was born. What it was actually doing was simulating what was called Rogerian psychotherapy. This is after a, a psychotherapist by the name of Carl Rogers, who was famous for sort of parroting back what the patient said to get them to explore it further. 
Uh, and this has been a sample application. It has followed us around for many, many, many years. I've seen this on PCs and so forth. Even the screenshot is from a much more modern implementation of the one that it once existed in the 60s. What's interesting about these early days is already we had these pictures of entities in artificial intelligence, and it pressed against the human's tendency to anthropomorphize. Fundamentally, humans sort of look for humanity elsewhere. Uh, we look for faces. We see them everywhere. I mean, folks see faces in trees. They see them in sporting equipment. They even see them in mountains on Mars. So we are prone to giving entity or agency to these tools that we've created, uh, even though they're not really there. And the ultimate manifestation of this, and really the first time that the word phrase artificial intelligence appears in the social conscious and the broader population is in 1968 in a movie called 2001 A Space Odyssey. Now, this movie is important for a bunch of reasons. In fact, most uh, directors that make space movies still refer to this movie as sort of the definitive work. Kubrick, as much, whatever you may have thought of him, he pushed the envelope. Before man had landed on the moon, he had already made a movie about mankind living in space. And he had commissioned Arthur C. Clarke as his futurist. They actually collaborated over making the movie. The book would come later. So this was not a book adaptation to a movie. Rather, it was a vision of a movie that became a book. But Arthur C. Clarke is a futurist. Uh, he's passed now, but... And by that time, he had already written about geostationary satellites a decade before they could be built. And they talked about machine intelligence and they used the phrase artificial intelligence and said that by the year 2001, we will have machines with intelligence that have matched or exceeded humans. Now, the downside to this, as cool as it may be, is, of course, that that artificial intelligence, that first time that it's seen in the public, the machine tries to kill everybody. And so we set a tone right from the very beginning to the rest of the world that, yes, we're going to make this artificial intelligence, and yeah, it's going to try and kill everybody. You know, Terminators, all those things will come later. But for better or for worse, with, for us as technologists, we've kind of set ourselves up into this current challenge. And I'm not saying the ethical debate isn't important uh, and, and, and something we absolutely need to focus on, but understand that popular culture has also grabbed onto this anthropomorphization and created perceptions that are incorrect. If you're working in this space, you know these things aren't true and that we don't have artificial generalized intelligence. We're still exploring what that would even mean for us. We build specialized intelligences. And so more often than not, when you end up talking in public about artificial intelligence, it comes across more as artificial stupidity. And by the end of the 60s, the promises that had been made in the 50s didn't measure up. And, and again, I think movies didn't help that here we were able to create these simulations of intelligences, we just couldn't actually build them. And so a lot of military funding and general funding dried up. And this is the first time we hear this phrase, AI winter. So the, the decrease in funding. Now, it didn't mean that the technology never worked. They did build important and powerful things that benefited the folks that were using them and continue to this day. The logistical engine of the U.S. military is a profound capability that uh, exceeds every other nation in the world. And the technology still continued, but the money that was available for research and, in, and inside of universities, not as much. And so when you get to the late 70s, after a quieter period, you do see a new generation of what was then wrapped in the AI banner again. So this is the expert system model. And this is in the late 70s, early 80s, which is also the emergence of the personal computer. So when you think in terms of the Apple II and the IBM PC that Gordon Moore has driven down the price of compute to the point where you can have a machine on your desk rather than require university scale machines. And so this generation of expert systems where they're capturing expert knowledge, largely in decision tree models, so call it almost like a super ELISA where it's just able to answer questions. But in order to have them run fast enough in those early computers, they're building custom super PCs. 
And so by the late 80s, there are a set of machines they called Lisp machines because they were largely programmed in Lisp. And they where the typical IBM PC of the day was three to four thousand dollars US, these are fifty to a hundred thousand dollars a piece. And there's about a dozen vendors selling them, and they're not delivering the value for the money that cost. At the end, by the 1987, sort of the end of this generation of computing, about less than 10,000 of these machines have been sold, and most of those companies go out of business. And so you get a second AI winter towards the late 80s. Now, all the models I've talked about so far were very much decision tree models. Eliza is certainly a decision tree model, and, and all of these expert systems fall in that class. And it brings this conversation forward that emerged at that time around this concept called the Neats versus the Scruffy. So the Neats, and let's face it, we're talking about Seth Waters here. He's very neat. Uh, are about logical and symbolic reasoning. So creating complex uh, algorithms that have repeatable steps that are logical and validatable, uh, Lisp and Prolog being good at that. This is most of the activity that happened up until now. But there was an emerging group, the Scruffies, that said that intelligence is just too complex to adhere to neat methodologies. And so now they're getting more into the neural net models, object and inherited models that created their own complexities in the sense that they were harder to measure, harder to validate, but they created remarkable results. Now, that we know today, with the benefit of hindsight, that in the late 80s, early 90s, when they were talking about this, that the scruffies were going to have a good day. But it didn't mean the needs didn't continue to progress. And by 1997, you get, I would argue, one of the greatest wins for the needs of all time in a computer built by IBM. So notice we've moved out of the university now. And we're talking about research groups and large corporations. The project was called Deep Blue. And it was to make a, ma a grand master class chess player. Now, the performance of this machine, you can see the size of it. It is taller than you are. It's about an 11 gigaflop mini computer. And I would point out in 1997, 11 gigaflops is a lot, but that's about the same horsepower as an iPad 2, circa 2011. But it did beat Gary Kasparov. It was became the best chess player in the world and considered a remarkable victory. Now, again, IBM continued on. This technology is the origins for Watson. And Watson hits its peak in 2011 with its ability to win a Jeopardy. And so uh, what, and the Watson technology continues today. You can participate in it if you want. They have a lot of licensing opportunities and they're heavily into the medical spaces and so forth. But it is important to remember that it falls into the needs category, very much the decision tree models. And they've really stretched that model to, to the lengths they possibly can. Let's change gears and jump to the scruffy conversation. And I want to talk about one particular scientist, Jeffrey Hinton. Now, I have my personal biases toward Jeffrey Hinton. He happens to live in Canada, as do I, although he's originally from England. Uh, he got his PhD in AI in 1977. Not a great time to be an AI researcher. It was a very challenging time. But he was one of the folks deeply entered in the neural net model that the Scruffies loved so much. And by the 80s, in that time of the list systems and so forth starting to end, he was talking about the fact that neural nets were in the 80s were just not sophisticated enough to do the kind of work they needed, that he'd come up with a mathematical construct called backpropagation that opened the possibility for much deeper neural nets, but sort of ends that paper with, these computers aren't gonna do it. They're not strong enough. And so that quiet period for neural nets yeah, and that's in that second AI winter, these deep neural nets, they don't go anywhere for a few years. It's actually students of Jeffrey Hinton's who sort of dust off that old paper from the 80s and start working on a new problem, uh, thinking the compute is now there. So we've got a new generation of computational power. And so by the in the 2000s, there was a new competition. So this is the ImageNet large scale visual recognition challenge. Started in 2010. Uh, taking advantage of the cloud and, and the available or the, the internet and the availability of data, it is a collection of 14 million hand annotated images. So it's a set of images that are already identified, tools for training with. Uh, 
And the competition was to build software that could recognize those images reliably. And in the first couple of years of competition, 2010, 2011, all, virtually all of the software were decision tree solutions. And the best they ever did was 74% recognition accuracy. Not bad. Humans do better. Not great. But Hinton's group in 2012 implemented a deep convoluted neural network. And they ran in the competition on September 30th, 2012. And their first attempt in, in, during the contest got an 84% result. By 2015, it was 100%. And so in that sense, the Scruffies had their day. The best the decision trees could do on this was quickly superseded by this modern neural net model. And uh, it opened the door to a huge explosion of technology. When I think about artificial intelligence today and this new spring that we've been living in, it starts here with this image recognition. Now, quickly moved over to voice recognition because, you know, one of the beautiful things about the academic model is the sharing of the papers, the sharing of the core concepts. And so very quickly, other organizations pick this up. And so looking at voice recognition, the emergence of Siri roughly in that same time. So SRI was the company, largely an offshoot of a DARPA project that was acquired by Apple using the convoluted neural net to do voice recognition. And voice recognition had existed for years before this, but it was much more that decision tree model and it required a lot of training. It was much more difficult to make voice recognition work. And then along came Siri and it just worked. Unless you were Australian, because some accents are harder than other accents, but that, that Siri, Google Voice, even Cortana, all roughly along the same lines. And what had happened was voice recognition in the old models that were 93, 94% accurate, suddenly jumped up to 99% accurate by switching over to that neural net model. There's an interesting pattern that's happening here over and over and over again in the evolution of artificial intelligence. And I've got this diagram I found that, that I found that sort of breaks it all down. Artificial intelligence seems to be the name of a technology that when it is in its immature state, or rather when it doesn't work. The moment it does work, it gets a new name. So if you look carefully at this visualization, you notice sort of in the middle there, the planning, scheduling, and optimization, the technologies that were worked on in the 50s and the 60s by Minsky and their folks, so the shortest line there, and then the expert systems from the 70s. And I haven't really talked about robotics, but that's also from the 70s when robots really appear in manufacturing. You know, there's a real, robots existed before the concept of artificial intelligence. There are some integrations there, but they're, they're kind of their own thing. Speech systems have been around a very long time, but they were transformed by the convoluted net. And now we have these, as these technologies are spun out, we give them new names, our image recognition, machine vision systems, our new ability to do natural language processing, even to the point of translation and doing classification, sentiment analysis, those sorts of things. And ultimately, in our modern version of machine learning, the deep learning predictive analytics models. And it's the hardware that's made the difference here, but not just the hardware, how we utilize it. The importance of the cloud in, ex in expanding the opportunities for artificial intelligence. Because often our training models require huge amounts of compute for a relatively short amount of time. And so we would still be confined to a few small areas in the world with that kind of compute available and sort of restricted access to it that would limit the expansion of artificial intelligence. The cloud leveled the field that anyone could build a model and rent that computing power for the short amount of time they need it for a reasonable price and then execute on their models. And there's only been a few occasions where we've seen major artificial intelligence events occurring that got us to a point where even the cloud was straining. But computers continue to expand. The evolution of the GPU and scalar computing optimized machines for these kinds of neural net models brings us closer and closer to the diversity of being able to do this in almost any location at any time. I also think the availability of data has a huge impact. And for better or worse, we have to point to social media as the impacts around that, that the tendency for more people to put more data online where it's readily available has provided mechanisms for us to train more models in more ways. All of these things have worked together to get us now to just a few years ago. I started to talk about this next generation. So, 2011, 2012, 2013, very ascendant models of, the, of those original concepts of Hinton. And I don't want to make 
put this all on to Jeffrey Hinden. I think he's an extraordinary man, but there are a number of extraordinary people in this field that have sent it all at the same time. I do want to talk about Go, because I think it's got a great corollary to the success in the 1970s by IBM with Deep Blue. Go was considered an impossible game to model, in the, certainly in the decision tree model. The 19 by 19 grid games are, are, are deeply cerebral, very complex games. You can't brute force your way through a computational model on Go. It's too many possibilities. Uh, the Google folks took it on with AlphaGo in a neural net model. And they spent two years training that model, uh, teaching it games. And so by 2016, it beats a world champion class. And of course, the famous event is in May of 2017, when uh, KG is beat three to nothing by AlphaGo. Uh, another ascendant moment, but they didn't stop there. I think what's more interesting still is Alpha Zero, that they took the, the approach that they did with AlphaGo, which took a couple of years to build, was sort of very traditional training model. And here with Alpha Zero, they used a much more sophisticated approach in neural nets, the adversarial approach, where it actually played itself for 40 days, knowing only the rules of the game, rather than having looked at many, many games, the way you would typically train a model. And so that in that short amount of time, it was able to beat AlphaGo against uh, playing Go. They also did a demonstration, and this was uh, just a couple of years ago, where they put it up against a chess program, Stockfish. And uh, not only did they show that it could beat Stockfish in a relatively short amount of time, but that the computing resources required to run the model to be, beat the best digital chess players was hugely lower, that it was a much more efficient way when you have a good model to actually execute in these kinds of complex problems. Now, there's still some conversations around what this all looks like, but it speaks to this ongoing evolution of AI in more and more sophisticated models. Now, I was going to steer largely clear of robotics, but really getting down into sort of the late, closer and closer to the current times, I want to talk about MIT Dactyl. So this is a robotic hand for manipulating objects. And we know that training models takes time. You have to do it over and over and over again. And so as soon as you start talking about training articulation like this, it, it can take impossibly long. What the MIT group succeeded to do with Dactyl was to simulate the hand in a virtual reality model. And so to allow it to practice the manipulation of an object in a digital realm at much higher speeds, the equivalent of hundreds of years of practice, and then to take that model, implement it physically, and have it have the same articulations. So this is, a, I think, a transitionary model we're starting to get into where the fact that we can create physical representations of those learnings, not just identifying images with probabilities or simulating voice or recognizing voice or any of these far more intangibles, but to actually have physical activities now be manifest with that same kind of training in a virtual realm. That, to me, is barely history. This is a year or so ago that we're getting to this level of experimentation and it opens the door to new potential. But it, it opens a question, which is, are we continuing to evolve? These are mostly engineering exercises. Fundamentally, we look at gains in the, in the modern neural net. We're engineering with those now. We're doing bigger and bigger projects. Organizations like Microsoft and Google and so forth providing us tools so that we as engineers can take these technologies and implement them to provide benefits to companies. But there's a conversation of, are we expecting another AI winter? And folks like Jeff Hinton have talked about the fact that there's another AI winter coming. But what they're really talking about is that the money being spent on research is starting to diminish. Now, I would point out two things. One is, in all the winters that I've talked about, it's not like the work disappeared. And it's not like work didn't continue. The rates changed. I think we've hit a period now where we're getting such good results with the technology we have that there's the energy to do research may be diminishing somewhat. So that perhaps there's fewer new innovations. And notice really not a whole lot of conversation about building an intelligence either. We're building, we're still using these technologies to build tools to do useful things for us, but not necessarily to be that tremendously intelligent. I would argue that we are still in a springtime or in a summer where we are providing value to organizations using a technology. 
And as long as we're doing that, as long as we're taking that technology, creating unique value from it, our work is going to continue. The rate of innovation waxes and wanes with need. I would argue the pandemic has put a lot of pressure on us as experimenters to show value rapidly, and that tends to diminish broader research. But that's okay. This is a special time. Providing value is important. It's good for us to have a retrenchment. Think about the value. And at the same time, when that value starts to level off, we can do some more exploration. Thanks so much for your time on this. I really enjoyed talking about it. It's one of my favorite subjects. And I'm hoping to stick around for the next half hour or so and be part of the panel coming up.